Well along the way in setting up this conference, it occurred to me that um, we really ought to talk about fraud and our own business. And it's unfortunately rather more pervasive than we would like. And of course, the name that came to mind was Ivan Aransky, who is very well known to many of you because of his re Retraction Watch. He's the founder of Retraction Watch, the editor and the main writer for Retraction Watch. He is trained as an MD. He's a professor at NYU. Um, much of his work has been in the sciences, but he's more than aware of the fraud that we're aware of, in particular in accounting. Um, he's thought a lot about what causes this fraud, um, how this may or may not be avoidable, and so I can't think of anyone better to speak about fraud in our own backyard than Ivan. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, thanks very much, Peter, and um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I, I have to say that whenever I come and hear from people who are thinking about what I would call similar and related issues, but in dissimilar and unrelated fields, although we sort of cover everything, I guess everything is related, I'm always struck, and maybe I shouldn't be struck the 15th time that it's happened, but just how much, how many parallels there are uh, in different areas. Um, I was describing to someone, I think, uh, last night uh, at dinner that a, someone, at, uh, a dean at the uh, Cornell School of Medicine in New York uh, got a bunch of us together a couple of years ago, and she did it again last year, who were studying these different issues, but again, in totally different fields. So Adam Marcus, who's my co-founder at Retraction Watch, he and I are looking at scientific retractions, obviously. Uh, that's what we do. But... She brought together people who were looking at whistleblowers, who were looking at uh, pharma litigation, who were looking at, in fact, one particular person who was suing and still suing the Chicago Police Department over disclosure of uh, disciplinary records. And it turns out that the percentage of fraudsters or percentage of people who break rules is remarkably consistent, again, if we believe the surveys that, and we all know the problems with those, but the fact that they're all sort of coming up with roughly the same figure of about 2%, which is what it happens to be, is really quite, quite interesting to me, and, and I just wanted to comment on that before I sort of go into my talk. Um, what, what I'm going to talk about today is retractions writ large. Now, I'll, I'll explain sort of what percentage of retractions are actually due to fraud, uh, because that's obviously the topic of, uh, of your conference, uh, but I want to give a global perspective that hopefully... It touches on some of the same issues that, and some incentives and underlying principles that I've heard this morning. I mean, some of them, it's almost eerie. I could do a Mad Libs and take out you know, lines from what some of you have all been saying and put in scientific publishing or put in you know, NIH funding instead of you know, whatever the, the funding source is, is here, and it'd be, it'd be remarkable. So let me start with uh, a bit of the landscape. Um, Probably can't quite see this, so I'll, but don't worry, the next slide will make it a little bit more clear. Um, I would ask you, is this publishing today? So I, I want to sort of set the framework a little bit, sort of set the stage a little bit, I, I apologize, for what we're dealing with with scientific publishing. Now, here's something that looks like a journal. Um, it has a journal title, which sounds official. It has an ISSN number with the Library of Congress. It has a DOI, and are all the things that those of you who are academics or even those of you who have just read papers recognize as, you know, this looks like a proper scientific journal. And it has a title and it has an abstract and all of that. It's not a particularly attractive looking journal, right? Because, you know, let's face it, the computer science and information technology people, they just don't have a lot of style, all, all due respect. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't, I don't either. I just make that joke. But, okay, looks like it's a journal, proper journal. I'd like you, and certainly those in the back of the room probably couldn't tell this before, but this is, I just want to zoom in on the title and authors of this journal, right? Authors of this study. Now, it's, it's, you all got it already, but it's so much fun to read them out loud that I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, you know, Dr. I.P. Freely, um, I ran into him in the, uh, in the men's room. He's a, he's a famous urologist, uh, Oliver Klozoff. Um, Jacques Strap is the French uh, colleague of Dr. Freely. Um, these are all actually Simpsons characters, right? 
Now, um, how did these august researchers manage to publish in this august journal? Uh, how many of you are familiar with something called um, SciGen? Anybody ever play with SciGen? I actually love it when I ask that question and no one raises their hand. I, I love it on the one hand because I like actually sharing fun things with audiences. I hate it because now any of you with a laptop are going to go do what I'm about to recommend and not listen to anything else I'm saying, <laughs> which you may want to do anyway. So SciGen is a program, software program, it's you know, on, online. Uh, that's not the URL. You have to find it. It's SciGen, Google SciGen, S-C-I-G-E-N, and MIT. It'll come up. Probably SciGen will get you there, too. So in 2005, a couple of grad students at MIT, goes without saying, very clever, you know, clever kids, they said, you know, they did what Alan Sokol did. Remember Alan Sokol, you know, mathematics at uh, NYU? Um, I call him a colleague, but that's sort of like, that, that's lame. He's, he's the faculty member. I'm just this kind of add-on guy. But Alan Sokol, he did what was, became referred to as a Sokol hoax, right? He was sort of fairly disgusted by the level of the literature in postmodern studies. And so he came up with a fake paper. And he made it look like a real paper. He came up with all these, you know, fantastic postmodern lingo, all this lingo and all this stuff. It got published. He ended up writing a book about this. So it, it was the Sokol hoax. So what SciGen is, is a, a sort of mechanized version of the Sokol hoax. So if you go to SciGen or whatever the URL is, you go to that URL, all you've got to do is put in any names you want. So you can put in your own names and in about 2.6 milliseconds have a paper, including a PDF, including some beautiful looking graphs and charts, which if you don't actually look at them, look beautiful. When you actually look at them, you realize that there are arrows that point to it, that point to themselves. Um, the x, the y axis and the x axes are, you know, anger and pain, like nothing, they, they have no bearing on anything. Um, Adam and I did this, we put our dogs' names in. Um, our dogs don't really have last names, we made those up too, because why not? And um, so they, we didn't actually try and get it published. But this is a paper that was clearly a spoof, where somebody wanted to sort of test what would happen. And people have done this again on a some more industrial scale. There was a sting of these sorts of journals, which are referred to as predatory journals. And some of you may be familiar with this, probably a number of you are. Uh, Jeffrey Beale, a uh, scholarly librarian out in Denver, he actually keeps a list of these journals, Beale's list. It's not a list you really want to be on, sort of kind of like Retraction Watch's list, actually. But um, these are journals where they claim to do peer review. They claim to have all the trappings of journals. And some they actually have, but they're not doing peer review. They're just taking your money because, again, open access is a wonderful thing. Uh, but part of the business model, as I'm sure you're all aware, is that you know, the authors pay to publish in the journal, which in and of itself is fine. But if, the, if there isn't rigorous peer review, then it's just a vanity press. And these are predatory. And so that's just an example of that. So that's kind of a fun thing, although there's a sort of serious problem we're dealing with. Um, let me tell you a little bit more. I would argue this is probably a fun story, too, but uh, that, that kind of gets at some of the fraud that we're really talking about here in terms of actually manipulating the process. So, this is a, a piece that uh, Adam and I and Kat Ferguson, who was our first staff writer at Retraction Watch after we got some uh, very generous funding from MacArthur Foundation. Um, this is a piece we, we published uh, in Nature about uh, a little less than two years ago now uh, in the feature section. It's not a peer-reviewed uh, paper itself. It's a you know, piece of journalism, uh, which you can go and read and all that if you'd like. Uh, but I just want to tell you the story, of uh, the sort of opening anecdote of this particular piece. So there's this researcher, his name is uh, Hyungin Moon, and he's a researcher in South Korea. Uh, he studies plants and some of their medicinal properties. Not an unusual thing for people to study. We have gotten lots of, uh, we've obtained lots of treatments and, and even some cures from, uh, you know, tree bark and things like that. That's, you know, that, that's, that makes sense. So he's studying all this, and he's got a bunch of papers that he wants published, and because he has to have a bunch of papers published in reasonable journals in order to get tenure. This is not a surprise to anyone in this room or probably anyone in the world. Um, and so he picks a particular publisher, and that'll be important. It's called Informa Healthcare. Now, Informa Healthcare is not Elsevier. It's not Wiley. It's not you know, Public Library of Science. It's not a huge publisher, but it's you know, a reasonable publisher, in, obviously, in healthcare. Uh, life sciences, things like that. And there were three different journals he picked. And there's a reason why he picked Informa Healthcare. Because all of the journals that Informa Healthcare asked him, and he knew they would do this, they asked him for potential peer reviewers. Also not terribly unusual. Uh, many journals, particularly in small fields where they really need to continually 
you know, grow their, their database of peer reviewers do that. And, and there's actually, again, in and of itself, nothing wrong with that. But here's what he then did. So uh, he would say, you know, the, 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 the form when he submitted uh, the paper, when he submitted the manuscript, it would say, uh, could you su suggest a peer reviewer who might know how to, you know, review this? And say, oh, you know, Peter Easton, wonderful, you know, plant biologist. He's, and as the editor, I would look at that and say, oh, yes, I saw Peter at the last meeting. He was, you know, he gave a great, great talk, and yeah, he studies this field. Wonderful, of course, you know, click, invite Peter to review the manuscript. But here's the problem, right? Uh, the email address that was provided by Hyung and Moon was not, whatever, P. Easton at ND, you know, I don't know what, dot edu, but it was P. Easton 123 at gmail.com. And who do you think actually got that invitation to review the paper? 28 papers were attracted because Hyung and Moon managed to do his own peer reviews on all of them. <laughs> now, you say, and now you're all, so I gave you something to do before to, you know, uh, you know go look up at SciGen, and now you're all busy coming up with brilliant papers that you didn't actually have to do any work to do. Now you're like, oh, I've got this paper I'm about to submit, and this is a wonderful idea that Aransky just gave me. I, I will tell you that just like we heard from the last panel, uh, actually two panels ago, you know, if you let out, I think the, I'm getting to get this wrong, but the, the, the sort of general picture, if you sort of, don't give everyone a handbook of how to commit fraud. So I just gave you a handbook of how to do this. Turns out they've closed the loophole in the, in the publishing system and all that. Um, but here's, here's, what, here, here's one of the many interesting p parts of this story. Um, all of the reviews came back. Now, it won't surprise you to learn that all of the reviews were positive reviews, right? I mean, why do this if you're gonna crap on your own work, okay? <laughs> so it won't surprise you that, and they were actually well-constructed reviews too, because it's sort of like, and, and forgive me again here, this is an accounting, I should be very careful using an accounting analogy in this crowd, um, but you know, there's a sort of urban legend or something that, you know, just make a, an error on your first few pages of your tax return, and then everyone in the, and someone, an auditor will find that and say, aha, I got you, but then you, you know, the real bad stuff's behind that. Okay, again, see, as a layman in your world, I, I, that's, that's one of the things that we're supposed to not do or do or what have you. Um, he wrote these really good reviews. Like, in other words, very well constructed. He, he had very specific things because he would say, you know, who knew Hyung In Moon's work better than Hyung In Moon, right? <laughs> he was the pure among, he was a peerless peer in, some, in many ways. <laughs> so, but here's, here's the problem, and here's why he got caught, and here's why I'm talking about him instead of, you're, you're not reading about him in, you know, in Sweden getting a Nobel Prize. You, re, you read about him in Retraction Watch first in 2012. Um, all of the reviews came back within 24 hours. <laughs> right? So anyone who has ever been asked to review, has been an editor, and most of the time you sort of end up doing both at some point in your career, that just doesn't happen. You don't even get a, you don't get a response to the invitation within 24 <laughs> hours. But to get back this beautiful, it's like, oh, it, it dropped from, it's beautiful. Um, so a, an editor confronted him, and he, uh, he confessed, actually. Uh, and then we, of course, ended up finding out about it and writing about it. So those were 28 papers, so keep that number in mind. This is obviously a, a numerically focused group. So um, just a little pop quiz. Uh, you would have no way of knowing this unless you'd been reading Attraction Watch uh, fairly regularly, probably. But uh, anyone want to take a guess? Obviously, the number is bigger than 28, or else I wouldn't be asking you. Um, how, many, how many papers have been retracted since 2012 for fake peer review, rigged peer review? What's the total number of papers? I, I'm not going to give you any more information than I already did. <laughs> how many papers have been published since 2012? Millions, but, you know. 200? 100,000? 100, <laughs> it's always, it, asking this question is also always a really good way to sort of get a sense, the, the, the sort of get a sense of the cynicism in the room. And um, I'm always amazed. So the number is closer to 200. The number is about, is about I think the last one, we, we, we keep a tally, and I think it was 319 the last time we did it. So 319 papers have been retracted for rigged peer review. Those are the ones we know about. I have a feeling that we're actually pretty close to finding most of them, because now everyone knows what to look for. But that's, that's a few hundred papers. Now I'm going to get to some bigger numbers. Oh, there's my slide telling you that. Get to some bigger numbers and put that in context, because I think it's always important to put everything in context, of course. So 
Told you there's 300 diffractions there. Um, I don't know how visible any of this is, and this doesn't, I don't think this works, but, um, uh, and it's also a little out of date because the guy who used to come up with this, who did a wonderful job, he, um, he stopped doing it. Uh, that's why the 2015 number looks kind of low. But what this is, is a look at PubMed retraction notices uh, against year. And it, and it also, what it does is on the, on the y-axis, it's, it actually sort of normalizes them, right, per 100,000 publications. So they're about, mm, I think, w like 1.4 million papers published every year. Some people say 2 million, but it's, on, you know, it's sort of on that order. It depends which index, you know, which indices you're looking at, what have you. So it, big number, okay? So you want to normalize this per 100,000, otherwise it kind of doesn't tell you anything. Um, but the number of attractions, what that bar tells you is that the number has clearly been on the rise, okay? Now... A couple interesting data points here. One is that in 2000, from 2000 to 2010, so the decade, the first decade of this century, uh, the number of retractions went from about 40 per year to about 400 per year. So it went up tenfold. Now again, as a percentage of the 1.4 million, let's keep that in mind, quite small. Uh, it's clearly not the number that should be retracted. I'll get to sort of maybe a little bit closer to that number in, in a little while. Um, and again, the 2015 number is just because that's the last time he did this. The number went up again, actually. Um, PubMed released their figures a the, uh, couple months ago. And for fiscal year 2000, uh, it was the government fiscal year, which, uh, but, but it's for 2015, there were 684 retractions. So things keep going up. And I suspect they'll, they'll go up for a little while longer than sort of plateau. Again, any time you open up, any, and, and that speaks to, I think, what's really happening here. And, you know, people say, I think there are people, and some, some of these folks are politically motivated, to be honest with you, or motivated by other reasons, um, who are sort of jump to this, to the conclusion, well, that means that fraud is on the increase. And I'll talk about what percentage of these are due to fraud. I have to say that we actually find no evidence that fraud itself is on the increase. Um, I mean, it's certainly possible, but what this really looks like is a screening effect. It's that people are actually looking in ways that they weren't before. Some of those people are actually robots. So what happened in, in to, from 2006, this, this chart doesn't say this, but from 2006, 2007, the number of retractions for plagiarism and duplication, okay, in other words, duplication is sometimes referred to very inelegantly and incorrectly as self-plagiarism. You can't actually plagiarize yourself. I mean, that's just, it's definitionally wrong, but it sort of helps people understand what that means. It's trying to publish your own work more than once, right? And so both of those things can be caught by plagiarism detection software, right? Authenticate, deja vu, other, other systems like that. Well, guess what? The num and that's when a lot of publishers, 2006 is when a lot of publishers started using that. So guess what? Number of attractions for those reasons went up, okay? Um, so that's one thing. But also all these papers are online, okay? So it used to be if you wanted to compare two papers or see what was going on, you would have to go down to the stacks, hope that the, you know, that, that issue was there, uh, hope the other issue was there, hold them up to the light, kind of try and figure it out, photocopy it, but then that introduces gran, you know, bad granularity. It, you just, it was a very, very difficult process. Now, you do the same thing fraudsters do. A lot of what we see in, in, terms, of image, in terms of reasons for attraction, I'll get to this in a second, um, is image manipulation. So using Photoshop to take a picture that didn't quite tell, say, you know, what you wanted it to and make it look more beautiful, make it look like it does say what you wanted it to. Well, that's very easy to sort of suss out when you put those two images next to each other or even superimpose them on a laptop, you know, just on a screen or blow it up to 800%. And all of a sudden you see these artifacts that, wow, how could that same artifact be there? It's almost, it's like, you know, when you blow up a picture and you see, you know, somebody reflected in the glasses, like all of a sudden, you know, CSI probably does that, and they, that's how they catch the killer or something. But, you know, that's what, that's what people are doing. And there's this whole army, which I'll talk about, of people who are, who are doing this. But the number is clearly on the rise, and my take home from this is that it, it really is a screening effect. It's people looking. The same way, you know, autism rates are going up, right? Are they really going up, or is it that we're just actually looking for it, and we change the definition a little bit? And I would argue that it's almost 100% uh, the latter. So just some common reasons that I'll flip through very quickly. I've already talked about duplication, AKA self-plagiarism, and that's responsible actually for about 15% of retractions. Um, out of the you know, 600, 700 a year now, it's about, uh, excuse me, didn't actually flip forward. Um, that's about 15% plagiarism. I think we all know what plagiarism is, although you'd be surprised based on something I'm gonna show you in a couple minutes. Uh, 
that's responsible for about 10% of, of retractions. Uh, image manipulation I mentioned. Um, and these, by the way, this is over all fields, but most of what we see, because it's most of what's published, is in the life sciences. Okay, so I just want to sort of make that clear. Uh, I will talk, of course, about a very famous, uh, infamous case in accounting in a minute. Um, fake peer reviews, which I've talked about already. Uh, fake data, which actually will come up when I talk about the accounting one and also some others. Publisher error, these aren't particularly important in the world, but they make us laugh. And one of the things we like to do at Retraction Watch is make ourselves laugh, hopefully make other people laugh, because otherwise, why would anyone read us? I mean, retraction, who, the, who cares, really? Um, and so this is when somebody, you know, a publisher publishes something twice, and it's no fault of the author. But you now, as that author, have retraction next to your, you know, when you go on PubMed or whatever the index you used is, you actually have retraction next to you. And regardless of what I say about retractions and how I think they're a good thing, which I really think, that's still a stigma. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's like having some, like a bad debt that somebody, you know, stole your identity and now you have a bad debt on your credit report. That, that shouldn't be, but it is. Um, authorship issues, these are the bane of everyone I know's existence in this world. People fight over this all the time. I should be, you know, we've seen cases where people should be on the paper who aren't. We've seen plenty of cases where people who shouldn't be on the paper are, okay? And it sort of depends on what your motivation was. We've also seen people just make up authors, sometimes for fun. Um, there's, there's one case, um, did anyone here speak Italian? Because I have to be careful if, oh, good. Uh, all right, all right. I'm gonna be looking at both of you because you'll tell me I mis mispronounced this, I'm sure. Uh, so there's this guy in physics, I'll try and keep this one short, but there's a guy uh, in physics in Italy, and he, you know, a reasonable physicist, he's a university professor, and um, he had some ideas, he had some theories and data that he wanted to publish, and he just couldn't get it published in good journals, like nobody would, nobody would publish it. So he's thinking to himself, well, I bet that if I added somebody from a, you know, famous university, a well-known university, it would, it would help me. And... Um, Turns out he was right, because when he submitted it with this fake name from someone from a real university, they all got accepted. Same exact paper. But he kind of, he wanted to have a tell. He wanted to have a little bit of a watermark in there. So he used a name, okay, that again, with apologies both for mispronouncing it and because you will know this is a rude thing to say in front of anyone, uh, he called this person Strancho Bestiale, which again, correct me here, but basically means forgive me, giant asshole, okay? <laughs> so there are papers in the literature by Strancho Bestiale, okay? Um, other people have added uh, their dog's names. Somebody added a hamster's name once. Um, it's, that's sort of fun, but that, that's not really what I'm talking about in terms of retractions. Uh, legal reasons, this actually probably comes up in, in, in your work, in the academic work a bit, because because of, uh, you know, whether it's copyright, uh, intellectual property rights, and things like that, where, uh, people may have thought they had the right to publish certain data, you know, based on certain data sets, and they actually don't. Um, or the companies say that they don't because they suddenly realize that they're giving away valuable information. Um, but anyway, that comes up. And then something that um, doesn't really usually lead to attraction, actually, and it's a big other subject about reproducibility that I will not talk about today because it could be another whole, you know, meeting, um, and that, that a lot of fields are looking at, uh, e economics in particular, um, as well as psychology, uh, is, and sometimes we see retractions for lack of reproducibility, not, not all that often. So just to sort of sum up in terms of what the retractions are due to, um, really a lot of them are due to misconduct. About two-thirds are due to misconduct, okay? Um, now there's a federal definition of misconduct when it comes to, again, scientific research, and that is uh, FFP. Uh, fabrication, false, excuse me, falsification usually goes in that order. Falsification, fabrication, or plagiarism. So while plagiarism is actually considered part of the federal definition, you could be sanctioned at that level for it, that's rarely the case. What people are usually sanctioned for, and this is the Office of Research Integrity or the National Science Foundation uh, Office, of Infe Office of the Inspector General, um, is for the, the other two Fs, okay, falsification, fabrication. Falsification meaning you've um, you know, made something look better than it really is. Maybe you cherry picked too much. Maybe you just, you know, didn't present your whole data set, um, or you just manipulated the image. Fabric, it, but but an experiment did actually happen. Fabrication means you made it up. And those those, to be honest, are the sort of bigger cases for us. They're much more interesting. But falsification is probably more common. Um, and this paper came out in 2012. And if you're interested in this issue, by the way, I would urge you to follow 
Uh, our grant scene doesn't do much work in this area anymore, but Farrakh Fang, who's on our, advi our, our board of directors, full disclosure, and Arturo Casadoval, and they kind of have a standard experience in this field, which is to say they didn't think much of fraud. They didn't think much of retractions. Um, they're both microbiologists. That's their line of work. Um, they're both journal editors. And it was kind of like one of those things where fraud, you know, all of that, that's, that's something that happens to, every, uh, to other people. It doesn't happen to us. It doesn't happen in our field. Well, all of a sudden, um, Farrakh had a case where uh, there was someone publishing in his journal who ended up having more than 30 retractions. And all of a sudden, he really had this eye-opening moment. And he said, this is something I really want to think about and get serious about. So this paper was published. And it found, that, again, that two-thirds of retractions were due to misconduct. What's interesting is that a few years earlier, Grant had published a paper saying that fewer than half of retractions were due to misconduct. And actually, they were looking at the same data set. And it's not that they had a fight and then somebody won. What happened was, excuse me, the retraction notices themselves, OK, are very, very opaque, very oblique in some cases, and often misleading or even wrong, or they say nothing at all. And that's one of the reasons Adam and I created Retraction Watch, was to report on these cases. I mean, if you ever want to really get a journalist interested in a story, just tell them, um, you know, there's something I'm hiding. I'm not going to tell you what it is. OK? We'll see, you in a, see you in a couple of weeks when I ask you for a statement on the document somebody just leaked me. That's, what we, that's how we usually do things. So um, when the reason that, that, that it changed was that Farrick and Arturo and, and Grant actually looked at Retraction Watch and other media sources as well and realized that a lot of these cases that, that were coded as innocent error or honest error in the previous study actually turned out to be fraudulent or misconduct. So just speaks to really how, how our understanding is changing. Um, so which fields actually retract? Uh, I will, you know, more or less people always ask me this question and I say, you know, everybody does. Um, it's the fields that don't retract that I kind of worry about. And, you know, with apologies to business and economics, which is probably somewhat represented here in some ways, um, those fields, basically, they, they hardly ever retract. Now, there's some good reasons for that in economics, actually, which is that a lot of papers that are considered seminal never actually get published. They, they, they sit in SSRN or in another preprint server forever, and that's fine, because they're getting beaten up, and people understand that you know, there's this version, that version, the other version. You wouldn't want to retract that. That's not the right mechanism. You want to make sure the record's correct. Um, but uh, and someone, this was a study, actually, someone did, and they looked at all of the, um, looked at all the retractions. I think they only found, what did they find, like 31 retractions in, like, in almost 10 years, which you know, is probably a little bit too low of a rate. Um, but, you know, if you look, for example, life, the life sciences, the basic life sciences have a slightly higher percentage of retractions, very, very slightly, uh, than other fields. But again, that may, that's probably due to a screening, screening issue. Okay, so we like our, uh, it, this goes back maybe a little bit to sports and, uh, and, and, you know, doping, I guess. Although this is kind of, this is the anti-doping right here, because you don't want to be on this list. Um, we, we like our leaderboards. It's a little bit like ESPN, uh, a leaderboard. So we have a list. This actually goes down to 30. I've just screenshotted the first 10 uh, of our leaderboard of people who've attracted the most papers. Now, a couple things to note about this, this leaderboard, and again, just the top 10. Um, Yoshitaka Fuji, how many of you have published 183 papers or more? I mean, your fields, I wouldn't expect that, actually. It's, it, this is a little different. But all right, so you, know, you can sort of rest easy that you will never beat him. Um, you, you will not be on top. Uh, Joaquin Bolt, who was the number one for a couple years, uh, was very disappointed, of course, when he was nudged out. Um, we, we tried to get his, uh, get his, you know, we sent a, a very nice, um, you know, plaque and all that. We tried to get it back from him, and, and it's like the Stanley Cup, and you know, just he held on to it. Um, so they're both anesthesiologists, actually, number one and number two. And so hopefully none of you are planning to have surgery uh, ever. Um, <laughs> No, I, actually, I would say I would trust anesthesiologists, maybe not the surgeon so much, but I would trust the anesthesiologists more because there's actually a guy named Steve Schaefer, again, he's on our board of directors, who has been pushing for this. That's why you see that. It's because he gets editors together and institutions to say, you've got to do something about this, and then all of a sudden you see all these retractions. So I trust anesthesiology, at least the research, much, much more. A couple other just things, and by the way, I'm going to get to James Hunton, who I think most of you have heard of. Uh, he's number 10 on the list. He's hanging on there. Um, I... I don't think we have anyone who's, who's going to displace him anytime soon, but uh, you never know. Um, I'll give, tell a little bit more about his story in a second. 
but so this is, these are the top 10, and it's hard to tell, of course, because different cultures, languages have different naming conventions. Does anyone know any, notice anything about all 10 of them? Any demographic information? They're all men. And in fact, if you go all the way to the 30, there are only two women on the list. So hooray for the Y chromosome, right? <laughs> uh, we are either better at committing fraud or better at getting caught at it. Um, and when I try to lie to my wife, I think it's clear which one I am. Um, but, you know, it's a very interesting now, and by the way, someone actually studied this, so it's, and you would say, well, you know, men are overrepresented anyway in, in academia and in senior positions and in, in authorship. Even if you account for that, uh, men are nine times more likely to be, to retract for fraud. So there you go. Um, here's our friend. Uh, uh, I, I actually was invited, I spoke uh, in, in the spring at Bentley, where, where James Hunton worked. For those of you who know, don't know the story, I'll, I'll tell it very briefly, but again, you saw him on the list. He's, he had to attract uh, more than 30 papers. Um, and and the, the crux of it, the sort of, if you will, the, the nut graph in our world of it, is that he was using, uh, again, accounting firm data that you know, was anonymized, and you would know better than me how that all gets put together so that he could use it. But he was claiming to have all these data that he had access to and that he had signed agreements, non-disclosures or not, you know, whatever the appropriate form would be, uh, consent would be, so that he couldn't share it with anyone else, only he could use it. Well, that and that, and you all know, that actually probably is legitimate, except that he didn't actually have the data. Uh, he was just you know, making it up. Or he had one little bit of it and he was sort of making the rest of it up to make it look like this. So it, it sort of, it, it actually, the same way the fake peer review opened up just a little window into a loophole, or not a loophole, but a vulnerability, I should say, in the system, that's kind of a vulnerability in the system. And from what I could tell this morning, I didn't understand all the acronyms, because this isn't my world, but my sense is that there's actually some you know, movement on this, not, not because of this, but just in general that people are thinking about this issue. Um, you know, it, it was a very interesting situation, and the Boston Globe is reporting on this one as well. Uh, and, it, and it was, you know, it started, as you know, several years ago, and the retractions actually, most of them came last year, uh, kind of all at once, but there was a report by Bentley and all of that. Um, we had a really active uh, comment section on this. Hunton and, his, and one of his um, co-authors actually contributed to the comment section right after and tried to explain what had happened, which I, I don't want to sort of, I, I don't want to give advice to, you know, fraudsters, but like, if you're guilty and you know it, even if you're, you haven't told your lawyer that, like, listen to your lawyer when he or she says, shut up, right? I mean, I mean I'm mean, i delighted if you talk more, and I will ask you for comment and all that, but it doesn't usually, it, it, you just, you, you know, you've got a shovel, take, take it away from yourself. Um, but actually, I, and I heard his name this morning, uh, and not surprisingly, um, uh, Harry Markopoulos uh, ended up commenting because someone using Harry Markopoulos' name but not actually being Harry Markopoulos, which is own kind of own kind of interesting thing, but as an anonymous commenter was leaving all these really like detailed and useful comments and people were responding to them. And then Harry got on at one point and said, okay, I just want you to know those are really interesting. That's not me. And I actually contacted him to make sure that one was him because I didn't want it to be kind of this really <laughs> bizarre sock puppetry. Uh, and, it, and it was, or at least I was convinced, I was confident that it was. So. Um, okay, moving on a little bit to, uh, again, bringing this broader a little bit and, and, and getting through some of this. Uh, you know, which journals retract? And um, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is, again, Farrick and Arturo did this paper, Fang and Custoval. This looks at impact factor versus retraction index. I think we all know what impact factor is, but retraction index is just number of retractions per thousand papers published, again, a normalized rate. And what you see here is that um, it tracks almost, uh, you know, I'm not a statistician, but, and it, I wouldn't want to call this exactly linear, but it's, there's a, clearly a correlation between impact factor and retraction rate. Now, a lot of people who want to see a lot of change and, and disruption in scientific publishing say that's because all these journals publish more fraud. I don't know that that's true. I do know that there, many, those journals have many more eyeballs on them. Um, but I will also tell you, and so I think, again, it's a screening effect, but I will also tell you that whenever I use this slide uh, when I'm working, when I'm on a panel with Jeffrey Drazen, who's the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, his, uh, he, he wears a bow tie. You may, you may have seen pictures of him but, or seen him on TV, and, and his bow tie actually spins when I use this, when I use this slide. He, uh, it's really funny to watch. But um, now he really, he doesn't see it as a mark of, and this, I think, gets to some of the issues you're dealing with. He doesn't see it as a mark of 
of pride that they actually retract more and correct the record. He sees it as a mark of deep shame. And um, their correction record, I think, actually reflects that approach. Uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll flip, that, that's just to give you the citation, but these are the data. Um, retracted papers, and this is in the biomedical sciences, retracted papers continue to get cited. Uh, I imagine there are some of you who are either familiar enough with law or law, lawyers yourselves to know that if you cite a precedent, you know, a legal precedent in a courtroom that's been overturned by higher court, like nothing good will happen to you, okay? <laughs> the best thing that could happen to you is you, you, you lose the case and slink off to the bar or move to another country, okay? But you could if they know that you actually, if you knowingly did that and you cited a case and lost, you, well, never mind you lost, you could be disbarred. I mean, you, you could face serious sanctions. That's considered malpractice. Not so in science. So what happens? Not more than 90% of the time, when papers are cited, retracted papers are cited, they're cited in support of your idea. I mean, that's crazy. You're citing retracted work in support of your idea without noting it's retracted or anything else. So this is actually one of the reasons, one of the main reasons we have funding is to create a database of retractions that would hook up to any, you know, whether it's EndNote, Mendeley, whatever you use, so that hopefully this wouldn't happen. So anytime you try and cite a paper that's been retracted, you get a little, hopefully friendly, but firm, you know, sort of warning, uh, an email or whatever, you get an alert of some kind in, in broad strokes. Um, but this is, this is a problem. It per these, th these problems persist. These, and so we have another leaderboard, which you probably can't read, but... Um, we have the top 10 cited retracted papers, okay? We really like this one. It's a little geekier than the other one, but this actually, if in many ways, is more interesting or more telling. So the number one actually has had far more, retraction, far more citations since it was retracted than, than it had before, which is sort of interesting. And we're actually going to start digging into that to figure out why. But the number two is a paper that you're all, I'm sure, at least indirectly familiar with, and that's the paper that claimed that there was a link between autism and vaccines. Uh, took, the took the journal, the Lancet, 12 years to retract it. Uh, and it, and it, to be fair, a lot of those citations are saying this was retracted. So I, you know, that's actually a good thing. That it, these numbers tell you nothing without the valence or without the, you know, the sensitivity on it. Um, but part of the problem, and again, this is a grant scene paper, part of the problem is that the journals uh, barely ever get the word out, or not barely ever, but a third of the time they don't tell you that it was retracted. So I kind of can't blame anyone, again, self-serving argument for our database. But here's the sort of problem that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, not so much that one, but I, I just want to run you quickly through some, some euphemisms for, and to give you a, a lighthearted sense of how journal editors work incredibly hard, I give them credit, I guess, for working this hard to obfuscate the real reasons for retraction. Okay, so here's, here's a, this is, this is a euphemism, all of these are euphemisms for a particular behavior that leads to retraction, which you will all gather in about 4.2 seconds, I would ask, since you're all smart people, to not shout it out because I want those of you who maybe didn't get it right away or who aren't listening at all, screw you, um, <laughs> to, to not get it till the very end, okay? So this, was, this is described as, uh, these are taken, you know, quotes from retraction notices. So this was described as an approach to writing, okay? So Adam wrote the post about this. He said, this is an approach to writing, the particular behavior, the way showing up to a bank with a gun is an approach to banking, okay? So... Um, the paper had a significant originality issue, okay? Now, I trained as a psychiatrist, or partly trained as a psychiatrist, so I was hoping this was like a Freudian thing, but it turns out not to be. Uh, inadvertently copied text. Uh, the English language does not have a word advertently, okay? So what this means, uh, well, we know what it means, but we, 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 why they use that instead of one word, I don't know. Uh, this is one where you, you totally know what happened here. I mean, it, this, doesn't really, this doesn't really hide it as much as make you wonder... Why did you need, I think that's 16 words, when one would have done? I mean, when I was learning how to be a writer, I, it's one of the things they taught me was don't use 16 words, one one, one will do. But I guess that journal didn't learn that. And then, of course, the last one, which in some ways is my favorite, but gives away the answer, um, sometimes it's directly taken from other papers which could be viewed as a form of plagiarism. <laughs> What's left unsaid is what else it might be viewed as. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, this is often the retraction notice that you get, you know, from some journals. Um, there's a couple in particular, although one of them has changed its policy, thankfully. Um, how many of you, since I know you're all clairvoyant, um, how many of you can tell the reason for retraction in this, uh, in this particular case? Okay. You can't. You have no idea. 
Um, they argue, well, you know, we just want to cleanse the literature. This is the fastest, quickest way to do it. I sort of get that, but you know, we've seen too many cases where the people, you know, whose papers these are about, end up. And it turns out, of course, that they committed fraud. They end up with uh, appointments at other universities doing just fine, and nobody knows because nobody talks to each other. Um, and again, going back to lawyers, uh, Nature wrote an op-ed, uh, an editorial, uh, a couple years ago. This is after the very famous and tragic uh, stem cell fraud that happened um, two years ago in Stapp stem cells. Um, and they said, you know, one of the reasons you see this, a lot of the reasons you see this is that lawyers are really entering. And we've seen this a lot. We hear from a lot of lawyers. Um, and lawyers are entering the, the, the respondent's bar. In other words, the people defending people accused of misconduct has become a very active active practice for a lot of people. Um, and so that's why you get these watered down notices. It's why it takes a while. Um, one journal did change, Journal of Biological Chemistry, which used to publish these one-liners like the one you just saw. Uh, that was Journal of Neuroscience, but they used to do the same thing. They actually, they got tired of us yelling at them, actually. We would, every single notice, we would beat them up in retraction watch, and everyone would go to them and say, why, you know, why let these two idiots, you know, continue to criticize you like this, just change your policy. And it took them, well, it took them five years, but you know, I'm, I don't know how much longer I'll live, but I'll hopefully see some more journals do that. And there are practices for this. Those of you who aren't familiar with Committee on Publication Ethics, if, again, if you're involved with journals, your journal or the publisher may be a member of COPE, but that's something to uh, look at. And just in the last like few minutes, and I, I know we're uh, started a little late, but we're still a little bit over time, so I want to be respectful of that. Um, I just want to talk about this sort of what's really happening and what we think is really exciting in terms of analysis. And I, I think this is uh, in sort of post-publication period, and I think this is uh, quite you know, analogous, if not, and not directly relevant to a lot of the work that you're describing in terms of auditing. Okay, this is essentially the audit that happens after something's published. So instead of pre-publication peer review, this is post-publication peer review. I wouldn't expect too many hands on this because it tends, this, 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 um, this site that I'm about to describe is really focused almost exclusively on, on life sciences. But anyone heard of PubPeer, pubpeer.com? Okay, wouldn't, wouldn't, not surprisingly. Um, you could have heard of it because any paper that has a DOI, digital object identifier, can be commented on here. And what PubPeer allows is for people to leave anonymous comments uh, on any paper they want. Now, people have a lot of problems with anonymity. I don't want to sort of, you know, brush those aside. I mean, we happen to be in favor of it, but we, we understand the issues. Um, but this has led to a lot of corrections and retractions. This is just one case. I could pull up, you know, a couple dozen. Um, if you contrast that with something called PubMed Commons, which is you know, part of PubMed, that's the government database, I referred to them earlier in terms of number of retractions and things. Um, they also have post-publication peer review, but you can't be anonymous. You have to use your real name. And not surprisingly, there haven't been any retractions or corrections due to that, because people just have a very different tenor of what, no, the tenor is less important than the facts. People are not willing to be critical. Science is hierarchical. Scholarly publishing in general is hierarchical. But then in terms of you know, getting into the nuts and bolts of how this is working, um, Yuri Simonson, this, this is, he's a psychologist, he's at Penn, and he has really made a name for himself in terms of finding out people who, uh, were, who were committing fraud. And this was sort of on the heels of the Diedrich Stoppel case. You may have heard about that one. He's pretty high on the leaderboard. He's got 58 retractions now. Um, what, what Simonson, and then this next case, which actually is exp explains what uh, how Yoshitaka Fuji, the number one guy on our leaderboard, how he was caught, is what they're doing is, and, and I, again, I, I don't want to get this wrong in this crowd because you probably would understand this better than I would, but in broad strokes, they're looking at the data sets and they're saying, how likely is it that these data sets sort of existed and, and could, could happen? So statistically, right, when we fake things, we think we're very good at it. Even if you use a random number generator, somehow this doesn't really work because that was created by humans or something like that. Someone explained that to me once. I'm not getting it totally right. But the point is we don't actually put in the right amount of variability. So the, or the, the, what I should say is the natural amount of variability. So this guy named John Carlyle, so he's doing what Simonson did, but for Yoshitaka Fuji's work. So he looked at Yoshitaka Fuji. This is a piece that Adam and I wrote for, for um, Nautilus about a year ago. Um, he looked at Fuji's work and he realized, and, and he said, how likely is it that these are sort of real, that they're naturally occurring? And the, the likelihood was 1 times 10 to the minus 33rd, which, again, is zero. In fact, I think it's closer to zero like, than zero is, right? It's so small. <laughs> and so the, the, they took this, you know, they took that to the editors 
who had actually, actually the editors commissioned it because they, there was already a lot of, there were a lot of questions about Fuji's work. And one of the, one of the really, to me, cringeworthy uh, sort of elements of this story is that this, this all happened, all their attractions started happening in like 2012. And so, in two, but in 2000, people had raised questions about Fuji's work. And somebody wrote a letter to the editor and said, you know, these results are, you know, too beautiful. And that's, of course, not a compliment. It's quite the opposite. And so they let him publish that. And then they, they published that letter. They, they let Fuji respond saying, oh, no, no, thank you for your concern, but everything's fine. He kept publishing. What did he do? Instead of publishing in the anesthesiology literature, where everyone sort of knew that, because there was at least this signal to people, he published in fields unrelated. So pediatrics, uh, um, uh, otolaryngology, I think it was, uh, ophthalmology. Because in anesthesia, you're always operating, you're always, you're, you're always sort of anesthetizing some group of patients, right? It's not just some random anesthetic uh, exercise. I mean, that's a whole other problem. If the, I mean, I think we unfortunately saw that with a very famous rock singer once, but, um, or many of them. Uh, so just to sort of close here, so one thing to say is that uh, crime is, uh, doesn't pay quite as much as it used to. And I think this gets back to um, you know, the uh, sort of what do you need to, be a, to, to, be an, to have an effective deterrent. And again, uh, criminologists will argue about that forever. Uh, but the question, and, and we actually have a, we have a column in STAT. Uh, we do that weekly, and this week's column is all about should scientific fraud be punishable by, um, by uh, you know, uh, jail time? Uh, should it face criminal sanctions? And, and it's interesting, because whenever we've raised that, all of our, com our comment thread lights up and says, you know, don't put any scientists in jail until you put all those guys in Wall Street on j in jail. So you'll appreciate that, right? Um, we can talk about that over, over lunch. Um, so this guy actually f is, went to prison for almost five years, and I, interest of time, I won't tell you the story, but I'm happy to discuss it later, of course. Um, but he was faking HIV vaccine uh, results in rabbits and uh, ended up going to prison because Chuck Grassley is the senator, is the senior senator in Iowa, and when Chuck speaks, U.S. attorneys listen. That's basically what happened there, but it's very rare. Only three cases of people going to jail for, for fraud, for scientific fraud in the last decade. And finally, I'll try and leave, on an, leave you on an uplifting note, hopefully, um, which is to say that, and by the way, economists love retractions. They've, they've seized upon them as this cool little data set. We love this because they put out papers like this. It's this data set of, you know, maybe 7,000 total, um, but, you know, it's got all kinds of different variables you can play with. Uh, you can think about the incentives and the sort of human behavior element, which, of course, economists love to do. And so a couple of them, and this paper has, this, this not this paper, but this finding has been replicated, I should note, which is kind of meta, but also important. Um, they found that when you retracted a paper for fraud, okay, um, what happened to your citations after that, in other words, of other work and of, you know, your work moving forward, was what you would expect, because you'd have a little bit of a black mark, it'd be fraud, and your, your citations actually went down probably 10 to 15 percent, I mean, if you stayed in science. In fact, your whole subfield could go down to 10 to 15 percent, which is, is probably a metaphor there about something in the punch bowl that I won't sort of say before lunch. Um, so that's what happened. But what was surprising, and I think sort of a good news story, is that if you retracted the paper and the retraction notice made it clear that it was for honest error, okay, and you came forward about it yourself, you didn't see a bump, you didn't see a, a drop in your citations. In fact, some of the data suggests you even see a bump in your citations for being honest. The, those data are squishier, to be honest. Um, but that's kind of an encouraging bit of news to us, which is to say that if we're, all we're really trying to do is keep the pool clean, right? Keep the science, keep retractions going for clearing the literature rather than for punishing and for, and all of that, and we're finding more of them that are for honest error, um, that's a good thing. And uh, that's sort of where I'd leave you, and that's all of my info and acknowledgments. Thank you. Just with respect to your comments about the low retraction rate in economics and business, I'm wondering is it also because man, um, higher proportion of the paper in those journals are using publicly observable data, like archival data, 
Uh, the other studies, like uh, in science, uh, they use response uh, participants, mm -hmm. which is not publicly observable data. So I'm wondering whether this is the main reason as well. Uh, that could certainly be part of it, yeah. I mean, I, I think, to me, the fact that there are more eyeballs on something before it's officially published, and that, that's actually also part of it. You, if you're using data that can be verified, which is why there's a big movement in all of science to have, excuse me, open data and depositing data and things like that, again, as an incentive, there's less incentive because you might actually get caught. So it's, it's very possible. No one's really tested it, but absolutely. Do you, you mentioned reproducibility, and I wondered if you had a sense how large, let's call it not dishonest, but um, uh, how big an issue reproducibility is relative to the dishonest examples that you've given us? Um, like many orders of magnitude. Uh, we're talking about not even the tip of the iceberg. We're talking about the, in terms of fraud and misconduct, you know, a few molecules on top of the on top of the iceberg. Uh, you know, again, depending on the field, um, and I'll just pick economics because it's probably closest to, to what uh, you all might think about. You know, a couple different studies now have found, uh, there was one that found about half of economic studies in particular fields were not reproducible. Another found that 60% weren't reproducible. Um, if you go, and that number is remarkably consistent. Uh, if you look at the basic sciences, uh, in other words, cancer research in the lab, not clinical research. Um, there was one study that found 90% were not reproducible. That, that's probably a bit high. But they sort of average out in the 50s uh, across many fields, including psychology. Psychology maybe 60, but they, they sort of, in the, in the 50s. So if we're talking about, you know, that's 0.02 or 0.03% of retraction of, of papers published are due to, you know, need to be retracted for fraud, including, and, and honest error, you know, whatever multiple that is, 50% versus 0.02%, you, you can do, obviously do the math. So reproducibility, and I think that we always have to be very careful to distinguish them because people kind of get wrapped up and they read headlines like why most published research findings are false, which is true in the scientific sense, but false does not mean the same thing to people reading. So what we do, I mean, these are false, right? You, you commit fraud, it's false. I don't, I don't even care if you got the right answer, like full stop. Um, and by the way, some of them end up getting the right answer later, but it's, you know, that, it's a very different phenomenon, much more important, much bigger. I wondered if you'd done any work on um, career concerns and fraud. So what I was thinking was um, retractions are a big deal. I wouldn't expect those to be very common, but do you see them concentrated among, so we all go up for tenure, year six, seven, eight. I would guess that you would see a whole lot of fraud in people out six, seven years and like this huge drop off at year eight or nine or something. Um, so it, it's, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it, the incentive, you know, we all know what the publish and, publisher parish incentive is, right? And that's exactly, I think, what you're, what you're talking about. And so you would think that as you got closer, you would feel the need to really nudge the results a little bit. And that may be true. We, we certainly haven't looked at it. But all the people on the list, most of them, most of the papers that got retracted happened after they got tenure. Um, but again, you may be training yourself. And, and, and uh, two very, and I'll, I apologize, I'll try to make these very quick. But one story, so Diedrich Staple, I mentioned briefly, psychology, what he described, and, and he sort of did it throughout his career. He got tenure in the middle of it and then continued, but also then obviously was fired for uh, retractions, uh, for fraud. He describes in his memoir, and given that this is someone who made up all of his data, I think we need to at least put a big asterisk next to anything he calls a memoir. But this sort of, <laughs> this sort of makes sense, and I, and I think it's honest, and I'll just put it forward anyway. Um, he describes that at the beginning, he, needed, he knew he needed to get certain results, you know, to kind of prove whatever, or disprove the null, whatever it was. And so he tweaked just a little bit in something that might not even be considered a QRP, a questionable research practice, and nobody, got a, nobody noticed. So he tweaked a little bit more, and he tweaked a little bit, until he was just making it up completely. So it's sort of like when you're in high school, I wouldn't know this from personal experience, of course, but you're in high school and your parents have a bottle of clear uh, liquor in their cabinet. And, you know, you might, just theoretically, you know, you and your buddy might one day after school, before anybody gets home, take a little bit of it to see what that's like. And after you pass out, you're like, that was kind of cool. And then um, by the end of high school, your parents, who really don't drink, have a wonderful bottle of absolute water. 
And that's kind of what, what gets described. You look, at the, uh, you look at the LaCour case from last year, famous, you know, we broke that. It actually, it was such a big case that it crashed our servers. I had to call our, you know, uh, Bluehost and be like, ah, and they're like, we'd love to take your credit card number now. Um, so there's a case where here's a guy he knew in order to get, to, you know, a position. So he was a grad student at the time. Again, you see these different places this happens. He knew he, uh, in his world, in political science, you publish a big paper like one big paper, and you have it. So he needed to time it so that it would get published as he was on the career, on the job hunt, right? On the on giving those job talks, so he could give a job talk about it. Guess what? Guy gets a position, a tenure track position at Princeton, this tiny little university you might have heard of once. And you know, I and and of course it gets rescinded once. You know, it turns out he was he was committing fraud. I, I, the people I want to talk to are the other finalists, because everybody knows who they are. Well, I don't know who they are, but everyone there in that field knows that number two and three, and I, I hope that they're off at you know, Harvard and Stanford, but they may not be, and, and that, that kind of thing. But he clearly was doing it so that he would have it at the right time.